Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Summer is often a time for getting together with our families. For most of my adult life, I lived far from my parents and my brothers, and so summer vacations usually meant John and I packing our kids in the car and driving 12 hours or more to the East Coast to see them. Now that we live on the East Coast again, I see my folks much more often, which is a really wonderful thing. In fact, this summer, John, our kids, and I will be spending a week's vacation with my older brother and his family on the beach in North Carolina. And we're really looking forward to some relaxed and unplugged time together. Now, it wasn't always that way. My older brother and I did not really get along well as kids. We are hardwired completely differently. We have different personalities, like different people, enjoy different pastimes. Other than a really freakishly strong family resemblance, we have nothing in common. And then, of course, there's the big brother, little sister dynamic. I think written somewhere in our family contract, he was assigned the role of know-it-all troublemaker, and I was the annoying goody two-shoes. But you could have guessed that, right? <laughs> we really didn't get along. But time and maturity has changed that, and now we can't wait to see each other. We are still different, but our love is based on something deeper than just our personalities. It feels so good to know that we share a kind of history and bond that doesn't depend on what kind of books we like or who we voted for in the last election. It feels so good just to know that we are family. This morning we are continuing to explore this idea of tricky family dynamics. We are sharing stories from the book of Genesis, our earliest family album. We began a few weeks ago with the story of Abraham and Sarah and the messy and often dysfunctional way they embraced God's promise. Today we skip a generation, and we pick up the story of the, two twin, of the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, Abraham's grandsons. If your childhood Sunday school lessons left you with the impression that our ancestors in the faith were somehow more perfect or more faithful or more pious than we are today, let me disabuse you of that notion. We are just getting into the third generation of Abraham's family, and we've already seen more deceit and bad behavior between family members than you'll find on an episode of Divorce Court. I always scratch my head when folks who claim that modern family life is going to hell in a handbasket yearn for more biblical family values. Really? Is this what they're talking about? The scripture passage today introduces us to the beginning, the very beginning, of Esau and Jacob's contentious sibling rivalry. After years of being unable to conceive, Rebekah, Isaac's wife, is finally pregnant with twins, and she's thrilled. But for nine long months, the boys are wrestling in her womb, and apparently nothing changes once they get out. You couldn't find two more different brothers, Esau big and strong and hairy, was a man's man. He loved to hunt, and fight, and swear. He was into instant gratification, especially when it came to food. The younger twin, Jacob, was more of a mama's boy. He was quiet and creative, a bit more introspective, definitely more strategic. While Esau couldn't see beyond his own stomach, Jacob saw the long game. Now, in ancient Near East culture, birth order is essential. The firstborn son, even if he is just a few minutes older, is in line to inherit the family property, the family name, the family status. And the second son pretty much has to make his own way. Rebecca has been watching her boys grow up, and she's been thinking about the covenant, the promise that God has made to this family that they will be founders of a great nation. And now Rebecca is an insightful, and resourceful woman. Like her mother-in-law, Sarah, she's not adverse to taking things into her own hands when it seems like the promise has hit a snag. She's even willing to defy the conventional order, to subvert the power dynamic if necessary. She knows that Esau, as a matter of birth order, is the rightful heir to the promise, but she also knows that he values it less than his next meal. Her money is on Jacob, clever, 
sensitive second son Jacob, her favorite. If anyone is going to be able to carry the promise into the next generation, it will be him. However, Isaac, the boy's elderly father, is in the dark about all this, metaphorically and literally. At this point in the story, he is blind, and he is unaware of what's happening between his sons. Our story, as we read it this morning, ends as Jacob tricks his brother Esau into giving him his birthright in exchange for a bowl of soup. We'll get back to that exchange a bit later, because, of course, the story doesn't end there. As the time approaches for Isaac to bestow the birthright blessing before he dies, Jacob and Rebekah hatch a scheme to make sure that Jacob receives it instead of Esau. So they wait until Esau is out hunting, and they put animal skins on Jacob's arms so that he'll smell like Esau and feel like Esau. And then he brings his father his favorite food, just like Esau would do, and convinces Isaac that he is Esau, and he asks for the blessing. Now, the plan goes off without a hitch, with one exception. Once Jacob gets the blessing, he realizes he's got to get out of there fast before Esau finds out. So even with the family blessing, he can't stay in his family. His mother suggests he runs away to visit her brother on the other side of the desert until tempers cool down. So Jacob runs away until the wilderness, burning his bridges behind him, And while he tells his mother that he'll be home soon, in his heart, he knows he may never see her again. Now at this point, I'd like to pause for a moment and ask the obvious question. What kind of biblical family values are these? Where's the moral here? Are we supposed to admire Jacob? Are we supposed to sympathize with Esau? Where is the grace? the wisdom, the guidance that we so often seek when we go to pick up the Bible to solve a family dilemma. So again, I remind you, the Bible is not a black and white book. Gray area abounds. As folks who take the Bible too seriously, to take it literally, we know that it is not an inerrant guidebook for living. The humanity, the flawed humanity of the storytellers is on every page. These stories were never written to answer our questions so much as they were written to start a holy conversation about what it means to be in God's family. And from where I sit, the first thing I realize is that God's family, like all of our own families, is complicated and messy and conflicted. These stories don't whitewash anything for us. Siblings fight. Parents have favorites. It's all on the table. Considering this is part of Israel's founding story, I think it's quite remarkable that these characters are not depicted as legendary superheroes or larger-than-life figures. No, instead they are tragically and wonderfully human. They make mistakes. They get it wrong. They put their own agenda in place of God's agenda and make really awful choices. And yet somehow, in the middle of all of this mess and dysfunction, someone agrees to bear the blessing into the future. And the promise of God keeps coming through. These stories tell us that our limits are no match for God's dream for us. Despite our humanity, God makes a way. For our hero Jacob is far from perfect. He's conniving and deceitful, and he takes advantage of his brother's weakness. And frankly, he's a bit of a coward. Once his plan is complete, he doesn't stick around to face the music. And so we have to ask this question. What did God see in Jacob? Why was God willing to entrust the covenant to this guy? Personally, I think it has something to do with Esau and that bowl of soup I mentioned earlier. I think God took one look at that episode and said, no way. How can I entrust my promise to someone who cannot look beyond his own stomach? Carrying on the covenant will require hardship and sacrifice and a certain kind of courage. The bearer of the blessing must see beyond themselves, be willing to face the unknown of the wilderness, the strangeness of a new culture, and leave the safety of home to go where God leads. 
While God doesn't ever pick perfect people, she always chooses people of imagination and vision and faith. People who are willing to trust in something beyond their own fears and wants. The blessing is bigger than any one person. And that, I believe, is the point. For this blessing that Jacob craved, this covenant that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son for, must survive. And that is why we are reading these stories today. Woven throughout these tales and myths and family secrets is the steadfast promise of God that it will somehow find a way, that God will always find a way to keep the covenant alive. God seeks an enduring relationship with all of us, even when we struggle to uphold our end of the bargain. Now, don't get me wrong. The fact that we struggle, the fact that we make mistakes, the fact that we make bad choices does not get us off the hook. Doesn't mean our bad behavior is okay. We can't hide behind our flaws and let God do the heavy lifting here. Because being bearers of the blessing is a big responsibility. Jacob will soon learn that when he finds that this blessing comes with a cost. He spends the rest of his life wrestling with God, sometimes literally. He takes on the new name Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. He struggles to create his own family. He's burdened by the guilt of betraying his brother. He is constantly discerning in a world full of doubt what purpose God has for him. And so, also, that the covenant can endure into the next generation. This blessing is not so much a reward as it is a challenge, an invitation to be part of the healing of a broken world, even as we are broken ourselves. That was true 3,000 years ago when this story was first told, and it is true today. These stories tell us that the world is full of problems and imperfect people and unforeseen obstacles. As individuals and as nations, we make bad decisions, we mistreat one another, and we generally make a mess of things. But thanks be to God, that's not the end of the story. It is never the end of the story. The promise of God, that God will walk beside us and invite us to be a part of his ongoing work in the world, that is bigger than anything we can throw at it. And it tells us that no matter how ill-equipped or clueless we may feel, God can work with us. You might have your own issues and problems and limitations and doubts that make you think that God's promise just might reach a dead end with you. If you are like me, you may be often overwhelmed by the gray areas of life, torn between options, uncertain as to which path God is truly calling us to follow. We question, we doubt, we get lost. But when I read these stories, I have hope. God has worked through each of these imperfect people and she can work through us. We are invited to bear the blessing into the next generation, whether we are the bossy big brother, the annoying little sister, or just someone who can't seem to get out of their own way. God wants us to be a part of her promise too. After all, we're all part of the family. Amen.